are continuing a study uh, that, that's loosely following a book that many of you are, are reading called 1,000 Gifts, written by Daniel Boskamp. And we, we invited you to purchase the book to read along. If you were following along, then this week you would want to read chapters 6 and 7 in, in the book. And uh, so that you would just kind of be on track with, with very loosely what we're talking about this morning. Several weeks ago, we, we looked at a picture, a picture that, that Jesus painted. It was a story of 10 diseased people called lepers getting healed. And only one of those who is healed comes back to thank Jesus. And, and where we went with it then, and it's where we'll go with it now, is this idea that we can all be more thankful. We could probably all spend more time being thankful to God. Um, some of you have been encouraged to, to start a list. I know that we've got at least one one person in the church, and maybe more, uh, who said, I'm going to make a list of a thousand things that make me thankful, that make me joyful. And, and that's, that's pretty good to have the discipline to write down a thousand things. And the purpose, the method behind the madness is that it would create in us <coughs> an attitude, a practice, a discipline of, of being thankful to God. God does so many things. There's this whole time idea phrase that I remember my, my grandma saying to me, count your blessings, right? So, and we didn't have the same grandma, so that was good that you can hear me I'm going to share with you from Luke chapter 17, 10 deals of leprosy. I invite you to read along on your smartphone, or we'll put it up on the wall behind me. We do also have Bibles in the pews. Luke chapter 17, as Jesus continued on towards Jerusalem, he reached a border between Galilee and Samaria. As he entered a village there, ten lepers stood at a distance. They stood at a distance because leprosy is very contagious. It's not fun. It's not nice. We tend in America to take our lepers and tuck them away in colonies uh, somewhere in the swamps of Louisiana, I believe. That's where, seriously, that's, that's uh, some of the biggest leper colonies in America are, are uh, tucked away there. And so not something that is socially good. And you would not want to hang out with them. So they stood at a distance. They cried out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests, which would have made no sense at all. The priests, very likely, said, get out of here. You'll contaminate everyone. I'm clean because I'm a priest, so you don't infect me as well. He looked at them and said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, as they walked in obedience to something that didn't quite make sense, as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. One leper. That can't be right. That can't be right. Well, here, let me tell you a story. Jesus, one of the ten lepers that were healed, as they went to the synagogue, one came back to Jesus, shouting, praise God. He fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him. For what he had done, he just pulled it, pulled it, pulled it down. <coughs> and uh, this man was a Samaritan. So he was not a religious person. He, he was not indigenous. He was not a local. It's important to know that because Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? The inference being that they were not foreigners, that they were not locals, that they were not religious people who didn't have the sense or the grateful hearts to come back and thank Jesus. Didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except this poor? And Jesus said to the man, Stand up and go. Your faith has healed you. So ten were healed. Only one returned to give thanks. And you've heard me encourage you. If you're reading the book, um, Anne Boskamp, the author of 1,000 Yes also encourages you to take time to, to give thanks, to grow an attitude of gratitude. That was uh, a phrase that she's used over and over. It's been years since I've told this story. But it's one of my favorites because it's about one of my favorite people. 
my last semester of, of college, I, I was also working at a church, and, and my college schedule, my senior semester, was, was such that I had to take the classes when they offered them in order to graduate on time, which I thought was important because I'd stretched a four-year degree into five plus years, and all of a sudden I was ready to, to graduate. And so I worked at a church, and the church was very accommodating in the sense that they said, if you need to work at night, some nights, you know, go to class in the daytime and work at nights, and that's and that, that's okay. And the church I worked at was a large church up in Palm Beach, large enough that, that the church had a night cleaning crew that came in every day and cleaned the church. The night cleaning crew was run uh, by a man named Ben. I called him Ben. Everyone else called him Pastor Ben. And, and Pastor Ben is, was the kind of pastor that they call a tent maker. Uh, his church was not big enough that it could pay him anything. So he owned this cleaning business. And he would clean at night and he would pastor on the weekends. And, and he was the first, other than my mom, who didn't tell me until later, um, he was the first person to say to me, Dustin, there's a chance that you're wired for ministry. And I think you need to pursue and pray the idea that, that God has called you to be a minister. And I told him he was insane. And, and he pursued. And, and, uh, and, and he said, I just want you to promise me this, that when you accept that God has called you to ministry, that you'll come preach at my church. And I knew Ben. And I said, but I'll be the only white person. And he said, but you won't be the only white person they've ever seen. <laughs> Just the only white person that they've ever heard preach. And, uh, and so Ben said, you know, I want you to come to church with me sometime. After your church is done, we're still going, is what, is what he said. He said, you guys get done at noon. We're not even warmed up by noon. And he said, so play on, you know, we start at 12, another two and a half, three hours. And he looked at me and he smiled and he said, pack a lunch. <laughs> I didn't know he was serious, but I went. I went to Pastor Ben's church, and, and, and this is, I don't remember a lot of the sermons, so don't feel guilty. I don't remember a lot of the sermons I preach after I preach them. Maybe you're the same way. I still remember the sermon that he preached. And, and his whole sermon was, you've got to have an attitude of gratitude. <laughs> And his one son played the drums, and his other son played the organ. And while he would preach, he would move. And, and, and he was just so full of joy and excitement, uh, you had no trouble believing that he had an attitude of gratitude. And, and whatever being full of the Holy Spirit meant, he was full. Of the, if there was drunk in the Holy Spirit, he was drunk in the Holy Spirit. He was full, of, and, he, and he would move, and he, was, and he had this gorgeous suit. You know, and then he'd walk up and down, and he'd get so excited sometimes he'd just jump. You've got, to, and the drums would, and, you know, and the organ would, and, and I remember him talking about cultivating this attitude of, of gratitude in, in your heart, and and I still remember that song. And it was as simple as you've got to have an attitude. Okay, good. Now I feel like you and I have it as well. And I would say this to you, that gratitude and thankfulness are critical steps in the journey of faith. They absolutely have their place, but I want you to see them as the beginning steps in a journey of faith. Taking time to make a list of things of which you're grateful uh, it, it is a great idea. I still encourage you to, to do it, to make another list, to continue your list, because it, it immediately, very naturally, very simply, almost sneaky, leads us into prayer. That as you look at this list, you write down things, you know, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful I've got joy because of, of this, and you go through that, and, and you realize, who are you thankful to? What reason do you have to be joyful? Because God has bestowed these things. He is blessed, He has given, He has poured out. And, and when we pray, when we give thanks, when we read a list of things of which we're thankful, we enter into communion with Him. We enter into relationship with Him. You, you heard me say all the time through this series that God is the giver of all good and perfect gifts. That's from the book of, of James. And when we train our heart and our mind to look in all of life for grace, then we become more and more aware of the good that is all around us. Many of you say grace um, before a meal. Maybe, maybe dinner, you get together and you say, say a grace. The, 
This is the story of, this is the one sermon I remember. This is the story of the one mealtime grace I remember. And I, I, I worked at a church out west, way out west, like where the ocean is out west. And three or four times a year, we would take trips of young people, middle school, high school, college age, and we would drive from California down into Tijuana, Mexico. And with nothing other than some t-shirts, some jeans, and some hammers and shovels, we would build houses in a week. No power tools, no bulldozers, no cement mixers. We would mix cement in big mixing troughs with shovels by hand. What I'm trying to say is it was not an easy gig. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm going to Cabo. It was, I'm going to Tijuana in the ghetto, and, and I've got, you know, 85 high school students who are going to build homes by hand. And we would take, you know, guys from the church who were contractors and knew how to do that stuff who would kind of point us in, in the right direction. And after a week, waking up before the sun and going to the work site, staying until that phase was finished. Oftentimes we would bring, you know, the, the church bands and put the headlights on so that we could finish in the dark. We slept in tents on the ground. And I don't know how long you've ever slept in a tent on the ground. It's not that comfortable. Don't be fooled if you're thinking, this sounds like, oh, this sounds like being restful. This is what I need for my soul. It was not. And, and I remember coming back from one trip. It was a high school trip. So we'd taken uh, a bunch of high schoolers, and, and we'd returned, and, and all the moms came and picked them up and took them off. And then we looked in the, in the garage of the church, and there was this enormous mess of shovels and hammers and kids just left clothes and bags and there was just stuff everywhere and we said we, we got to clean this up and then so we spent the next three hours cleaning this up and my, my volunteer team and, and myself and, and they didn't have a choice and they were really good to me and afterwards they said can i can i take you guys out for dinner and they said and more <laughs> and i'm still paying off that cat and, and, I, and i remember sitting around the table and we would do this it's, it's kind of a stupid thing but we would sit at the table, and when the food came, you'd put your thumb on it. And, and, you'd go, and as people saw it, you'd put your thumb Don't do this. The last one to put their thumb on had to pray. What was I teaching people about prayer? <laughs> if you're slow and not observant, you have to pray. <laughs> I've always said, if you're looking to follow Christ, do not look like me. his turn to say the prayer. And I knew there was this moment of panic because he was not an out loud prayer person. Some of you were lit. If I asked you to come up here and pray out loud, you would rather die. This was the person. And I looked at him and said, want me to do it? And he waved me off and he said, everybody stop. Food had just come. Been in Mexico for a week. Eating dirt. He said, close your eyes. Take a deep breath your nose. Wait. Thank you, God. Amen. <clears throat> Why can't I pray like that? Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. That was a moment where we were able to taste and see that the Lord is good. And you know, and I know, that God can provide material blessings such as food, and we're right to give thanks for these things. We're correct to have a mealtime grace, to teach our children to pray before a meal. The Gospel of Matthew tells us a story of Jesus providing food for thousands of hungry people. This parable right here is how I know that our very own Bill Schneider good, is more like Jesus than I may ever be. Jesus and Bill are both great at <coughs> feeding a lot of hungry people, right? You've been to a pancake breakfast. You've heard the parable of the Salties benefit, where Bill fed the entire town of Marathon with only one can of spaghetti sauce and one package of spaghetti. Let me share a similar story about the feeding of the multitudes with only a few fish, a few loaves of bread, Matthew chapter 14. That evening, the disciples
disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It's already getting late. There's no talk about it. So send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, That isn't necessary. You feed them. This made no sense. This was like telling a leper, Go to church and show the priest your leprosy. It made no sense. So the disciples pushed back because they were spiritual. They thought they had common sense. They thought they had reason. They said, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. And Jesus said, then bring them here. He took, he told the people to sit down on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up towards heaven, he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and afterwards the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all the women and children. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He is the giver of so many great things. He is the giver of food. He is the giver of laughter. He is the one who gives peace that surpasses all understanding. He is the only one who can give you forgiveness, sunrises, sunsets, healing, love everlasting. And so it's right, it's proper to make a list, to be intentional of things that make you thankful. In, in the book that we read this week, uh, Ann Boskamp says this, giving thanks for what is creates an appetite for more, but not for more things, but for seeking more of God. This list is not just another weird idea that I have. It's not just a strange idea that the author of this book has. This is an idea that God has put before us. In Psalm 118, verse 1 says this, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His faithful love endures forever. So again, He is the giver of so many great, good things. Laughter, peace, forgiveness, sunsets, Children, grandchildren, a cooler full of fish, a meal shared with great friends, with the right attitude of gratitude in our hearts, these are all things to be received with great thanks to God. He loves to lavish and pour out blessings on his children, just like you like to give presents and gifts for your children, for your grandchildren. Maybe you've gotten to see the joy of Christmas morning as young people open presents. You know, and there's just this flurry of paper, wrapper, shrapnel everywhere. And your heart is full as their faces glow and are filled with joy and awe. And I believe that God is not that different in the sense that He is joyful when we open a gift. And we are grateful. But he's more than just a cosmic Santa Claus. He's more than just a supernatural giver of toys, gifts, sunsets, safety, miracles, salvation, life eternal. He is so much more than all of those things. Those things are part of God, but those things are not the sum of God. They are not the whole of God. There is more to God than just gifts and blessings. It's not even His deepest desire that we would just go around being thankful. It's just the beginning of where you and I would start. There's a, there's a quote from J.I. Packer that you'll find in your reading this week that says, the life of true holiness is rooted in the soil of awe, adoration. It does not grow anywhere else. 
you know. And I remind you that God's desire is to know you and to love you. His desire is to become known by us. The goal of the follower of Christ is not to become more like Christ in as much as the goal of the Christ follower is to know God more and more. And as you know God more and more, then you're going to look more like Christ. But the goal is not just to, to imitate for the sake of imitating. The goal is to know God more and more. From, we talked about confirmation class several weeks ago, and, and I remind you that the chief end of man, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever, to enjoy Him, not to enjoy the presence, not to enjoy the sunsets, to look at those things and go, that came from you, God, and I love you, and I follow you. There is a huge difference between love and creation and loving the Creator. And the reason, the only reason I bring this up is that I kind of had an awakening this week. That I've been reading this book and going through the workbook and making my list. I'm grateful for this. I'm joyful for that. And colorful bubbles of, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> exercise and, 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 I'm right, and, and then it hit me. I've been going about this completely the wrong way. I was so impressed with my list of all the great gifts, the blessings, the abundance, that I was growing incredibly grateful for the gifts, but I had not taken the appropriate time and devotion and dedication to show my appreciation to the giver. I was making my list, but I had not redirected my gaze away from the gifts to God. I was still focused on what I'm thankful for this and thankful for that. And I think that God wants us to be grateful, to appreciate. But he had never intended the gifts to replace or be a substitute for him and his presence. When, when there's something, a gift, call it a sunrise, call it a meal, call it a child that replaces God in our devotion as the top. There's a word for that. It's called idolatry. And our hearts will always be restless until they find their rest in God alone as the one. Psalm 46, David declares, Be still and know that I am God. There's no one else. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. <clears throat> there are countless responsibilities and there are countless gifts that want your devotion, that want your attention. But there is nothing more important to me than spending time with God. When we wait, when we are still in the presence of God, God is able to do His best work in us. And if we skimp on this time in His presence, just being in His presence, you will not be shocked that you will plunge headlong into the wrong activities of life. You will miss the richness of what God has planned for you. So God would say to us this morning, do not seek me primarily for what I can give you. Remember that I, the giver, am infinitely greater than any gift that I might impart to you. Though I delight in blessing you, my child, I am deeply grieved when my blessings become idols in your hearts. Anything can become an idol if it distracts you from me as your first 
love. As you wait in my presence, enjoy the greatest gift of all, God in you, the glory of God in you. We exist as people and as a church to give glory to God. And we're coming up on one of those holidays where people will show up here who don't normally show up here. And the first thing I've got to say to you, as we get ready for Easter week and Holy Week, we call the week leading up to Easter <coughs> Holy Week, the first thing I've got to tell you is that when people come here on Easter week, they don't know that's your seat. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know that your bottom has perfectly <coughs> in that new cushion. Please do not hold that against them. <coughs> when you show up and you go, Do you mind just scooting over? Like, Please do not do that. <laughs> you, you, I, I have this idea that people think at Christmas time and Easter time that they're supposed to go to church. And you know what I think? I think they're right. I think that we are supposed to worship on those holidays. And I think it's our job to help them worship on those holidays. I think that there are thousands of people outside these doors that don't know where hope comes from, that don't know that healing and forgiveness are real. And so we're going to do services here, working backwards from Easter, the Thursday before Easter. We're going to do a commemoration of the Last Supper and we'll have communion. <coughs> On Good Friday, we're going to do a service here that as, as we go through the service and read the stories of the crucifixion that will dim the lights, and then we'll just finish in candlelight. Saturday night, we're going we're to try something, and we're just going to try it. We're going to do a Saturday night bluegrass service. Somebody say, all right. All right. All right. Okay, you're going to, so just imagine that there's, uh, you know, you're going to play fiddle, not violin that night. Uh, we're going to have the fiddle, we're going to have the, the mandolin, the, the guitar, the, we're working on a banjo. Are we working on a banjo? Randy? He says yes. <laughs> there you go. Uh, bluegrass. So now Sunday morning, if you want to do anything, pray for, uh, for Sunday morning. Because listen, listen to this. And this is all with the intent of getting people who don't go to church to church in a significant way that they meet God. So we're going we're gonna to start at 7. We're going to have a 7 o'clock Sunday service in here. And if you're good enough to show up at 7, we're going to feed the multitudes. I'm not going to feed the multitudes. Bill Schneider is yeah. going to feed the multitudes. Pancakes and bacon, 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock. We're going to have a regular 9 o'clock service. The reason that we're doing a 7 o'clock service is that last year 9 o'clock was not safe. Um, the, the parking lot, was there were too many people here. But this was too full. It felt, it felt really full and not and just chaotic. And we don't want people to come to church and go, it's too full, I'm never going back there. Well, here's, here's the reality, they're not coming back next week, we know that. Um, but they might, they just might. At 10 o'clock, we're gonna have the Easter egg hunt that, that Patty Ivy has already got hundreds of eggs. She would take more. She would take some volunteers willing to help her stuff some eggs and put some eggs. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll have our 11 o'clock service. Here's the goal that I want to set before you. The goal for that week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, is that a thousand people would come to church. And before you go, boy, that would be awesome for his ego. <laughs> is that why we do what we do? For ego? for pride so that we can pat ourselves on the back and tell the other churches we had a thousand people. It's not even close. All that Christianity is for you and me is one beggar who has found bread sharing it with another beggar. You've got friends and family that could use some bread. 
the bread of life. And we want to share the joy of knowing Christ with our friends, with our neighbors. We want to share Jesus without him. There's no point, really, in getting together here. You know, the band is good, but not that good. Sometimes the sermons are good, but they're never that good. But God is that good. His love endures forever. And so I encourage you to seek Him and Him alone today. Not just His gifts, not just His grace, but God. The presence of God. One more scripture. Psalm 16. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasure of living with you forever. Dear God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Would you help us to desire you above anything else.
Thank you. 